Thank you guys for being a part of College Knowledge. You know your support means everything to us. Please leave us a review and help us grow and help more families. Welcome to the College Knowledge Podcast, sponsored by the College Planning Network and Paradigm Financial Group. Whether you're searching for that right fit college, applying to college, or figuring out how you're going to afford it all, you're in the right place. You'll hear from deans, admissions counselors, student athletes, and scholars from esteemed universities and colleges around the country. We'll dig deep to uncover their insight and unique experiences. So whether you're a student gearing up for college or a parent with college-bound kids, sit back, relax, and listen. Like you, we have lots of questions. Our guests have the answers, and we're excited to share them with you. Let's get started. All right, everybody, welcome back to College Knowledge. I'm your host, Dave Kozak, alongside my Joe, my, my, co-host. my Joe. My yeah, co-host, Joe, Joe Kearns. Uh, today we're interviewing uh, Mr. Robert Corey uh, of Agile Rainmakers. Uh, Robert, welcome to the show, and, and I'm excited to talk to you. Thank you for having me. So give us a little bit, you know, what, what, what's the inspiration behind Agile Rainmakers? What's your goal? What, what are you trying to achieve? And what, what's your message? Well, uh, first, thanks for hosting me. I really appreciate this opportunity. Yeah. The inspiration behind Agile Rainmakers uh, as a company is a business and advisory company. It's a consulting company that uh, services high growth companies. And so I work with various uh, companies and I have a women-owned timber company, a uh, crypto company, uh, I've worked with fastener companies, a lot of different companies. And... Uh, after spending 21 years in the financial industry, having various roles uh, in 2018, uh, I decided, you know what, let me do something different. Let me advise high growth companies and branch out a bit. And um, the inspiration is, you know, I've been fortunate enough to be successful and work with some incredible teams here in Chicago. And I thought, well, why don't I advise companies on how to do uh, what I've done or what we've done as a team? So that was the inspiration for Agile Rainmakers. And along the way, I uh, just decided to hire interns to work with me. And uh, that has blossomed into something that extraordinary. And, uh, you know, basically, I uh, <clears throat> decided, you know, I just uh, I needed some help to get things going. Uh, but the first intern blew me away. And I thought, All right, you know what, maybe I should create a intern program. Mm-hmm. And uh, at this point now, uh, I've had about 20 interns. Uh, I run I run the business myself, so it's just me. And yeah. you know, every summer, I'll have four to six interns, and it's been fantastic. So uh, in that, well, first of all, congratulations on the uh, step into entrepreneurship. I think it's uh, there. more people need to do it. We're, we're uh, if we rely on big business and big government to handle things, it's going to break. So. Uh, <laughs> I love the fact that you're getting into it. And, and I, I particularly in our area of interest, love the fact that you are um, using this internship environment to uh, two things, right? Number one, it helps you out. You get stuff done. Number two, you're giving a great real time education to these students as they're, you know, in their college pursuit or, or potentially post post-grad. Uh, so I think it's a, it's a big deal. Um, have you taken the internship model i guess do you have a great model for internship how do you get the interns are you producing interns for other organizations at the same time are you using uh your ability to acquire interns to place them in companies that you're consulting with so how do i get the interns i uh, you know went to princeton Mm -hmm. and i will tap into the princeton careers group uh princeton students and typically we'll find at least two or three from princeton uh, every year also, you know, there's, you know, family friends and they have kids and, you know, I may hire one of them. Oftentimes someone who's interned with me will say, hey, I have a sibling who is at MIT. Uh, could he or she intern with you? So it's uh, been fairly uh, haphazard and random, uh, which frankly is how I like it. You know, okay. I like it being like that uh, versus, uh, you know, you get you put an ad out there and you get 60 resumes and you spend a lot of time sifting through those which I've done. Uh, and I started, built and sold a recruiting company at one point, And I know how to do that stuff. But I, in terms of getting folks, I, I, I leverage word of mouth. And what that does is it puts an onus on me to put together a really good internship program. 
Um, because if you're not putting together something really useful and valuable, they're not going to tell their friends and family and whoever to come and work with you. And I like holding myself uh, to a real high standard in that way. So that's typically how we get uh, a lot of them. Uh, I will, in April and May, I will go out and I'll just find clients who need projects done. Okay. Uh, I'm fairly good at sales. So I'll go get projects and I will curate them and have them ready for when the interns come and work in June and July. So we'll uh, have, have the students then come and work as a team. So I'll hire, last summer I hired six. Uh, they work as a team on all the clients. And so they get great exposure across various industries. Uh, they've worked with uh, a sync business. Uh, they've worked with, um, gosh, uh, a movie uh, distribution company. Uh, all sorts of different kinds of clients, uh, financial industry, mm -hmm. uh, to uh, as a team. And that way, they're not competing with each other. And they are collaborating and learning from each other. And the client is getting work far better than what they would have expected from any in intern group. And then uh, in terms of placing them at clients, uh, I haven't really done that yet. Uh, I mean, I, we could, uh, but the uh, students tend to, um, you know, they tend to be freshmen and sophomores mostly, sometimes juniors. Although we can get into a little bit about the statistics around being a, a junior in college and what you ought to do with your internships. Uh, so I haven't really gone to place them with clients, but, you know, maybe in the future I do. I, um, you know, was was a recruiter and, you know, maybe that's still in me in some ways in the future. Okay. Some of the things with the interns, you mentioned uh, Princeton and, you know, more word of mouth from a couple. Is Princeton the main school that you draw most of your interns from? Or is there other schools? Is that more the... Like you're saying, the hey, we'll take the applications from all over the all over the place, or do you have a specific area of the country that you focus on at all? Uh, well, I uh, initially started remote because of COVID. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I uh, then you know so it was kind of open in that regard, and I've now become more oriented towards folks in Chicago. Or surprisingly, uh, I had someone last summer when I told her she's fantastic. Uh, but she's living in, you know, the D.C. area, um, you know, can't really do it. She said, well, I'll move. Hmm. So I was like, OK, well, if anyone's willing to move to Chicago for two months over the summer and uh, things like Airbnb today make it easy to do yeah, that sort yeah. of thing. Oh, absolutely. In terms of the college, I have focused on Princeton um, and uh, that's worked out well. But I've had other interns from uh, Penn State and uh, Tulane. OK. And, uh, you know, I'm. Looking at candidates at University of Chicago, potentially Northwestern, some other places. It's not necessarily the school I'm focused on. Uh, it's just for me, like, you know, my full time job is advising the high growth clients. Mm -hmm. I kind of insert this internship program in addition to that. So I try to not have it be like a, a, as uh, time consuming as it might be in it, you know, leveraging uh, Princeton makes it as easy for me, given I went there. Yeah. Uh, and I go back every one, every year, you know, at least once. So that, that's been the thinking on that. Uh, any particular majors that you look for when you're pulling students? Is there anything specific in that realm for you? Uh, yes, uh, I look for diversity. So uh, if I have a team of uh, six interns, uh, one might be a journalism major. Another one might be uh, operations research. Uh, one might be computer science. Uh, one could be... Uh, uh, politics. So I am I am kind of major agnostic, although I do like to have a couple of engineers or folks who are heavy duty technical for technical oriented mm -hmm. client projects. Uh, but I also like to have the ones that are uh, more uh, uh, with the soft, better with the soft skills, perhaps uh, not to say the technicals don't have that mm -hmm. these days. But I also like to see you know, some diversity, some like very good writers or very good uh, creative thinkers. I mean, some of the, you know, best interns uh, end up, you know, they were a mark, they're majoring in marketing, you mm -hmm. know, you're like, wow, you know, that they're pretty well rounded in that sense. And so, uh, but I, I, I kind of look at, you know, the, the whole becomes far bigger than the pieces, mm -hmm. but the pieces have to be uh, of diverse uh, uh, majors. If I, I, I can't hire like, you know, uh, five computer science majors. You know, then I'm going to feel like a computer science professor <laughs> for a summer. And I, uh, you know, uh, the questions I'll get will be, 
you know, a little um, more challenging than I, than I would, than I'd want. Yeah. Uh, so you're like building a team kind of focusing on what you may need for this group. That's what it sounds like. It's, do you, do you look for what, you know, the specific like job or internship, the, the deal that you made the contract on who you end up building that kind of team with kind of before the fact, or is it, yeah, I just know that this, this, uh, we'll say this, uh, what do you call it? This recipe <laughs> has worked in the past and this is what I'm going to continue to do. Or do you kind of get very specific with it each year? Yeah. So that's a great question. It's uh, it's a dance. Okay. So I have a, you know, I have my like standard five high growth clients that I work with. And sometimes they have projects that I, I know are budding. And so I can kind of gear towards those. I mean, the crypto client has been wonderful every year. And, uh, you know, that kind of need someone who's CS oriented to handle that. Um, but I look for just really good students first. And then uh, once I have a team, I mean, when they say yes to me, they're saying yes to somebody who, you know, doesn't even have a project for them yet. Mm. But they know I'm going to deliver. And I do. Okay. And uh, so I will make sure I get the team first. And as I get the team, I will learn more about their interests. Because one of the things I do is once an, a student says yes to interning with me, it's not like, okay, thanks, you know, it's January 15th, and we will talk to you on June 1st. What we do is we set up a conversation every six to eight weeks for 30 minutes leading up to the internship. So we'll have two or three more touches between offer acceptance and start date. Part of that is to build that relationship and help them reduce anxiety so that when they show up, we have a, we're connected. You know, mm -hmm. it's not like, oh, who's this Rob guy? They know me a little bit and I know them a little bit. And as I'm getting to know them, I'm getting a sense of, you know, do they play a sport? What are they doing after school? How are their class is going? All these things. And that's informing me on the kinds of projects to go out and find, you know, come April and May to set them up with uh, during the summer. So my process right now mainly is um, find the students first and then go to existing clients, see if they have projects and, you know, and then find more new clients mm -hmm. and projects, you know, if I need to, to make sure there's enough for them to do. And it's the appropriate level of difficulty. Oh. A couple of things you really have to pay attention to. So in, in, uh, and speaking of internships and our listeners, obviously they're all at some point in the college career out to try and find their first job, which is oftentimes this internship, right? I mean, it's usually the first time they're in either uh, the environment uh, that they've been studying or they're going into uh, really kind of solidify, this is what I want to do. Um, what's, what's the best advice you can give for a student to prepare for a solid interview? The key thing in preparation is knowing yourself. If uh, you don't know what you like, you don't know what you're interested in, it's going to be very hard to sell yourself. An interview basically is the opportunity to sell yourself. That's, that's what that is. So you've got to know yourself really well, what you like, what you don't like, and why. And that will help the person interviewing you really understand you. So that's the first thing. I always talk about knowing yourself and and in the book, How to Intern Successfully, we emphasize that in the first few chapters, because without that, I don't know how you're going to find something that really speaks to you when you don't know who the you is. Mm -hmm. In terms of the preparation, it's going to take, you know, the typical, well, go through the LinkedIn profiles of people that have worked at that company, get a sense of their backgrounds, get a sense of where people leave and go to next. So you get a sense of the company holistically. All right, so going there, doing that kind of search and understanding there. Obviously, the website, going over that, you know, very important that you're up to date on what's going on. You might want to, leading up to the uh, interview, uh, put a little Google search so that you get a feed every day of every time that company is mentioned in the news, in case something pops. I have a, a news feed, a Google news feed that I get every day. And anywhere that internships is mentioned, I, I get a consolidated list of all the articles out there that mention internships. And uh, you can do that for a company. Um, and then the other thing, too, is for, in preparation, I like to say start with uh, family and you know, friends of your family in, ta in terms of learning what they do and understanding what people do all day. What do they do for work? Mm -hmm. 
and you know, could be uh, service providers for your for your family or uh, former colleagues. But what that'll do is it'll help you hone your interests and really start to understand. Oh my gosh, you know, I really love law. I went ahead in that direction. Or gosh, you know, that manufacturing uh, friend of the family they do some interesting stuff there. So um, really learning that way, and also talking to as many alumni as possible from your high school or your college to get a warm voice that's given you insight and understanding that you may not otherwise have. Um, and then the, the last thing I'd say is uh, you got to do some independent reading. You know, that, that to me is one of the best things. I mean, uh, when I interview somebody and, and, you know, they share like, Hey, I've read all these books about consulting, or I've read all these books about advising companies and, you know, or I read this, this uh, newsletter, or I read whatever that, that really makes a big difference in an interview. If you ask me. Are we jo- or not joking here, but are we talking about the college admissions process or internships? It, one in the same way. We, we, so it, there's a, and, and it's not, and I, I was about to go there too, because yeah. it, whether you're going for a college admission, whether you're going for an internship co-op or true job, all of the things that you just said resonate beyond, right? Number one, you're talking about trying to get into an elite institution and you get the opportunity to interview. You better have a good idea of self what you want, why you want to go there, the history of that institution, what they're known for, what you're interested in there, and be able to articulate that. Um, that self-knowledge and the articulation of that self-knowledge is critically important, right? Um, and I think, Joe, your point is, is very well received. I, and, and I'll go one step further. The networking, Rob, that you talked about is the same, right? It's the, it's the same thing. Like, if you're a student on your way to college, having the conversation, where did you go to school? What was your experience like? What did you major in? What is your job, right? It's all, everything we're all doing, the three of us on this call is trying to get people from, hey, I don't know where I want to go or what I want to do to, hey, they're a productive member of society with a job and a, and a career in front of them, right? And so I think you, you got to, it's, it's the same pathway each time. It is. And one of the things I talk about in the book is organic networking, mm-hmm. you know, where, you know, you start with your family, your family, friends, you work towards alums, you're talking. And this is where you are authentically asking what they do for work. You know, you're not coming to them looking for a summer internship immediately. You know, who the heck wants a phone call? And the first thing somebody is doing is asking for something from you. Yep. You know, you go around first and you just get some understanding of what's out there and who's doing what and do some reading and thinking on your own. Then come back later and go, hey. Uh, Dave, I've talked to, you know, 15 people uh, in various industries. And you know what? Financial planning is very interesting to me. Would you guys happen to have an internship there? Mm -hmm. You know, and I'd love to talk to you more about it. And by the way, I read these three books about investing. And I was very curious about your thoughts around this, if you've read them. Now, that is a whole different conversation than, uh, hey, Joe, do you guys have a job for the summer? Uh, I don't have any, I'm not doing anything in my Friends told me I got to get out of my house <laughs> and make some money. Yeah, it, it's it's interesting too because um, you know the natural, or what you call it, organic networking is. I think so many people stress networking in, and it's not it's not a difficult thing. I think it requires a genuine curiosity, number one, and the audacity to ask a question. Right? I mean, that's what networking is. And so your willingness to ask someone because you have a genuine curiosity gets them to engage, right? What, what do people like talking about, Rob? Themselves, right? Everybody likes talking about themselves to some extent. So simply asking the question to someone about what they do or how they react or what their daily job is, that genuine curiosity. I mean, and, and again, we're talking about self-knowledge. We're talking about understanding self, right? Well, if somebody says something that resonates, you just learn something about yourself. The end, right? Mm-hmm. I always tell people in, in uh, like, how do I know what major I should select? And I'll say, well, have you ever gone home after a class or a lecture and they said one thing and it intrigued you to do a Google search and you went down the rabbit hole and you learned a bunch of things on your own because you were genuinely interested? Ding, ding, ding. That's something you need to explore. Where is that field of study in life, right? Where is that field of study in this institution? People that, you know, they, they and, and I'll, I'll use the engineering world as an example, right? Everybody's parents know that we need engineers, 
the world knows that we need engineers. And so it's a very stable thing, right? It's a very, it's, it's got high prospects for people. So, you know, parents push their kids to be engineers. Well, it can be a very painful choice if it's not something that you're genuinely interested in. And I think that goes for college. It goes for everything, right? You're, you're not being forced down any particular pathway at college. And one of the biggest issues I have right now in higher ed is their job in higher ed is to teach you how to think, not what to think. And I think we have a problem right there in that in itself is we're starting to teach people what to think as opposed to how to think. And I think there's a, there's a, there's a real clear line when that should stop. But the, the bigger point here is anytime you engage, engage with someone and there's an intrigue ping, right? Ding, ding, ding. Something made sense. Explore, right? Dig deeper. Dave, I'm having one of those Joe uh, moments where I'm like, are you kidding? Because uh, I actually, you know, came home from Princeton and I was like, you know, I'm really interested in this art history class I just took. I mean, never mind, I'm colorblind. So (laughs) 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 it's all good. And it was a total non starter with my parents. It's like, no, you know, you know, you know. My culture, you know, it's doctor, lawyer, engineer. Yeah. Well, as a doctor, it didn't really speak to me. I mean, he worked crazy hours. He delivered babies, at, you know, two in the morning. And I'm like, I really don't want that lifestyle. Uh, lawyer, though, you know, very noble profession, uh, that didn't speak to me. And I, I don't read that fast. So well, I had engineering. That was my choice. And you talk about painful, uh, Dave. I mean, I, I, I write about it in the book. I mean, it was just painful for me to be an electrical engineer major at Princeton. It just really wasn't the major I should have picked. And it was a grind, but it was what I was supposed to do. And you know, you, you're, you know, you're 18, you're 19, Yep. you're doing what you're told and it's not, not exactly a calling, but you're going to make the most of it, except it gets really hard and a lot harder and more time consuming. And I'm, you know, I'm sure it turned out, but I think it, it, it could have gone a lot smoother if, uh, you know, I was free to say, okay, you know what, I'll, maybe it's not our history, but maybe it's economics, or maybe it's philosophy, or, yep. you know, maybe something else that, that spoke to me, and that I was given the chance to really think about what spoke to me. Mm-hmm. And instead, it was, you know, I mean, I'm sure I'm not the only one who's grown up, I'm sure they're kids today, doctor, lawyer, engineer, you know, and, you know, and, and that's it. And yep. uh, that, that word painful, though, that, that really uh, resonated with me, Dave. Well, I, I mean, I, I can duplicate your story. My cousin, uh, basically were my two cousins were told that they were either going to be lawyers or engineers. That was it. Those are the choices. They both chose lawyers or sorry. They both chose engineering. My one cousin became a civil engineer and then went to law school. So he ended up the law path, right? My other cousin chose electrical engineering on a ROTC scholarship and went into the Navy for four years as an engineer on a U.S. destroyer absolutely despised everything about engineering could that like just i mean hated it beyond hated it got out then got a government job post deployment in engineering hated it right and then he went polar opposite and was like i'm going to do sales and i was like you know there's a and and he went on to get his mba in, in you know in in business and so but the idea that people are um, I, I, I don't know if it's, it's the American dream that sets people up that way. Like, oh, my kids have to be more successful than me. So they, they got to go down a pathway that, that provides them more opportunity. But some of the most successful people I know didn't even graduate from college. Not saying that you don't, not saying I am most certainly a believer in college education, higher education, right? But the idea that you choose one of these three royal professions, let's say, and it's just going to work out and your life's going to be hunky dory and everything. It's just, it's just not the case. So, you know, there's an old expression that if you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. I always say that's a load of honkus. Work is work, right? It doesn't matter what you do. It's still work. You got to grind. But if you find interest and satisfaction out of the work that you do, you're going to have success. Right. That, that's the because you can measure your satisfaction, and utility a different way. Um, you know, it's the same reason I'm not a I don't I don't run the rat race of retirement planning, although I do retirement planning. I focus on college because it's to me, I'm passionate about people getting into the right school, making the right social, economic and financial fit. Right, Joe? Mm-hmm. I mean, they, we talk about this all the time. So it gives me a higher uh, 
utility and satisfaction in the work that I'm doing while I am moving money and planning finances, do all that. I'm doing it with a specific direction to get people a better launch in life in the college environment. So I think, again, it's important to realize that if you understand yourself, this is all comes back to self, right, Robert? This is the idea that if you know what you like, or at least what is intriguing and interesting and, and not boring or painful to you, your prospects are much better when you have that. And so, you know, it's funny because we use a strong interest inventory for a lot of our clients. We, get, we put the students through the strong interest inventory and all it does is tell you likes and dislikes. It kind of kicks back to you likes and dislikes. And the idea at a 16 or 17 year old age to know that, hey, you like this, but it's not a viable vocation for you. It's an avocational like. Like one, when I did the strong, it came back and said, I like farming. I should go into agriculture. And while I do enjoy livestock, tractors, and the farm environment, I couldn't think of a more painful everyday existence <laughs> to have to get up at 4 a.m., feed the livestock, do the plowing of the fields and do all that stuff every single day. Now, when I want to unwind and I want to go jump on one of my antique tractors and, and drive around like Farmer Bill, that's fun, but it's vocation versus a vocation, right? Mm -hmm. If you haven't seen it yet, we have a free college planning brochure at EliteCollegiatePlanning.com under the resources tab. This is a free resource that explains what college planning requires and how elite collegiate planning serves these needs. And remember, plan early, pay less. Well, you're speaking to a bunch of points there. Uh, one is that, uh, you know, first of all, it's so wonderful that you get so much fulfillment doing what you do around college and, uh, you know, and funding for college. I mean, I would, I would say that if you can get your college funding down right, you actually are setting yourself up well for retirement, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's, hey. if you get it wrong. Now you're, I'm you're, having a Joe moment. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, I mean, that to me um, makes a lot of sense uh, around that. And then, you know, in terms of like you being, you know, potentially a great farmer or, but not liking it and all that, you know, one of the things that I'm committed to around this whole internship stuff, which gives me a lot of fulfillment as well, is what I've noticed is we are missing dignity in the internship discourse. Mm -hmm. well, let me explain. Yeah, please do. So do you realize that 40% of internships in the U.S. are unpaid? Mm -hmm. In fact, the White House, just in the last year, started paying their interns. There's no dignity, in my mind, around unpaid interns. You mean to tell me you can't afford two or three months of minimum wage for someone with no benefits, whatever, Yep. Just common in turn with you. Well, evidently that's the case for about 40% of the opportunities. Mm -hmm. And that I assert has no dignity. That's one thing. Second is, you know, internships oftentimes are the butt of people's jokes. You know, I mean, you know, we there's some high profile stupid things that happen with interns that employers do, uh, you know, most often in the political yeah. scape, but in other areas too. And right, that's just got to stop. This is that student's first impression of what a career in the workplace is going to look like. Mm -hmm. And the onus is on the adults in the room to behave that way. Well, let, we, adults right. in the room is a big question, too, because I, I agree with you. I agree with you wholeheartedly. <laughs> okay. I gave them act like adults, but go ahead. Well, at least put on a face for two or three months and then right. you're an adult. But, like, so that, but there's no dignity in the, the having it not be taken as seriously as it should. Yeah. Um, thirdly, um, we don't get back to the uh, students, uh, you know, like, hey, we, you know, yes, you're going to intern with us or not. You know, you just get, get in communication with them. That's, mm -hmm. that's missing. But the other piece, too, is uh, I, I'll have my interns work with me for a few weeks. And I have some simple rules. They work really well. I'm, I'm uh, almost done with a second book called Intern Management, which is the uh, the other side of how to intern successfully is for the employers. And I lay out some of these simple rules. One of the simple rules is you work from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., period. You're not allowed to work before 9 a.m. or after 5 p.m. You're not allowed to work during the weekends. Why? Well, now you are focused at work. You're not surfing the web. You're not texting. You're not chatting away. You got till nine, and you got nine oh five. You got work to get done, and you know, of course, there's a you know, they can take a half hour to an hour lunch. I don't, I'm not going to micromanage that. Mm -hmm. But simple rule like that gives them focused attention. 
We're here to get stuff done and done really well, right? So, you know, and and thinking about ahead of time how to have the internship be dignified when they show up. We have a project for them that, you know, that's ready to go. Access to data, who they would talk to, what it entails, the, the degree of difficulty has been considered so that it's not something that's going to leave them really, really upset because they can't do it. And it's not going to be something that's so easy that they're bored and they laugh and they think it's a big joke. Mm-hmm. You've got to put some effort into where you're going to calibrate this thing. But that would be dignity. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and another the, the last piece around, uh, you know, that I'll mention, there's a lot. But, uh, you know, when it comes to dignity is, uh, you know, having a relationship with them where they matter. You give them feedback at least once a week. You know, optimally, you're meeting with them daily if you can. You're developing a relationship that will go beyond the internship because they're going to come back to you for a letter of recommendation or they're going to come back to you for a reference. This isn't like, you know, uh, you know, here uh, you show up. I, 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 you know, I don't know what you're going to work on here. Do my expense report and uh, pick up my dry cleaning. And can you get lunch? And uh, oh, yeah, we'll get to your access to that data project we told you about next week. And I'm, this happens. Mm-hmm. That sort of stuff, it still happens. It's the year 2023. There's no dignity in that. It's got to stop. And so uh, this book, this book series is all about bringing dignity to the internship discourse where we start to look at it as an opportunity for not only the company to get some great work done, but also for the student to learn, grow, and get an understanding of what the workplace environment can be for you know, today and in the future. And hopefully five, 10 years from now, when they host interns, they do it that way mm-hmm. rather than giving them nothing all day. And then at five o'clock saying, here, get this done for tomorrow. Right. We're not, that, that needs to, you know, I, you know, everyone's going to run their business their own way. I, I get it. Right. Fine. But guess what? If you're not thinking about them and how to take care of them in some way, and I'm not saying coddling them, I'm just saying be thoughtful and plan ahead and operate with dignity. Uh, well then don't expect it later. Yeah. You know, yeah. so. Yeah. But, Go ahead, John. <laughs> uh, the one thing that comes to me, especially when you were talking about what some students can prepare for an internship or an interview, I think that message that you just delivered is what students need to hear. And potentially, like when you're researching internships, and you like those are some questions that I think that they should answer, right? Don't it's the same thing with schools. Like, don't just take an acceptance or don't take an internship just because of the name on the side of the building, if that's what the intern's going to be, you know, if it's going to be, or you're getting lunch, you're picking up dry clean, like ask questions because it might say, Hey, I'm working at Apple as an intern or the government. And you send, you say, look at what the job actually is. And you go, I'm going to hate this. This might end up, this is what I was so passionate about. I might have to not want to do this. So I think asking those questions, those rules that you kind of laid out, realize that as a college student, like if you do it right and you're researching up, you might get to pick. So ask some of those important questions, because I think that can go a long way. Well, and I think there's this other part that we're, we're not even mentioning, which is you have a sophomore, freshman, sophomore, junior in college coming into an internship. They are out to prove something. Mm-hmm. They're up for the challenge. But you can't challenge someone if you haven't thought forward to what the challenge is and what the, what the desired outcome is. And so if you're going to lay a project on someone, you better tell them what done looks like, right? What is done to you? And, and let them step in and, and rise to the challenge because these are hungry people trying to prove their way into the workforce, right? I happened to enter the workforce in 2005. It was the most miserable time to try and get a job in the history of getting jobs. People were not retiring. People were, they, you know, companies were paying more for people to do less and the upward mobility was basically stalled inside companies. And it was one of the things that motivated me to go into entrepreneurship is like, it was hard to find a job. And when I did find a job, they were similar to what you're talking about, internships, entry level, where it wasn't real entry level. It was more like half entry level, but we were hanging on because, you know, the, the VP at the top wasn't going and the guy wasn't moving up and they weren't creating. And so 
one of the one of the inspirations behind everything was to create jobs in my world. And I will tell you something really, really interesting that you bring up about the dig- dignity of internships. I've been at this battle for a long time in business, and I always wanted to hire interns. I always thought, man, if someone gave because someone did give me a shot. I got an internship when I was in college, and I it was paid, and it was a it was a recent acquisition that four four men did of a twenty million dollar company, and um. I came in and they were like, we need you to do this, this, and this. And then we want you to design our next program. And they gave me full reign. And uh, because of that opportunity, I was able to actually exercise in multiple areas, sales, finance, uh, just general management, production management. And it led to a, a very fulfilling internship that I was able to actually write a thesis to get credit for class at my college. So it was, it was an all around win. But I have always gotten to the point where I wanted the intern, but I didn't take the time to create a dignified opportunity. So I never followed through. And I think there's something interesting there. That the reason I haven't done it is because I know the responsibility and the time it takes to create a valuable opportunity for me and for that person. It's got to be a win-win, right? The company's got to get something and the student's got to get something. And to just pay someone minimum wage to scan documents to do, do things that are below uh, their, their actual education, I think is, is tragic. And so that's interesting. You just, that just connected the dots for me on that. Well, we all add to that. Like, uh, let's say, let's say that you guys wanted to hire an intern in the summer, but you know, you're not, you know, sure. Like you have the time, what to do, all that stuff. So what I do in April and May is I'll reach out to folks like you and I'll say, listen, I've got a team of interns that are starting in June and, uh, I will train them. I will manage them. Let's just you and I talk about what project you want to get done. Mm-hmm. And we'll make sure we get it done really, really well for you by the end of July. And what you'll get is, you know, obviously you pay a fee, but mm-hmm. what you get uh, for in exchange is that work done. And I ask that people, what's worth double what we're going to charge you? You know, what would be worth double what we charge you? And, uh, and then I manage them and you get exposure to them. Because one of the things I do too, so there's no dignity in having interns do that work. And then Rob Corey presents it to you guys, <laughs> right? Yeah. And I know that's got to happen some places, all right? And I tell the I tell the students, listen, when you intern with me, you're going to talk directly to the founders, the CEOs, the managers. Okay, it's your work. You're going to present it. I'll be there. I'll listen in. I'll provide feedback for you afterwards, during whatever. Mm-hmm. Make sure everything is great. But you are going to be having these conversations with these people. I remember my first intern. I had him sit in on a on a meeting with uh, the portfolio manager of a, of a pretty significant uh, long short uh, equity hedge fund. And I, I didn't think much of it because I know him for years and I'm an investor and all this. And uh, afterwards, the intern was glowing. He couldn't stop talking about how he just met the portfolio manager of this, you know, like yeah. he was on cloud nine. He's like telling his family, his friends, you wouldn't believe this and all that. And a light bulb went off for me. These kids, they don't get that. Mm-hmm. that. They're not expecting that. That's really something special, something great. Well, so then I thought, God, you know, why don't I have like, you know, a few clients like that? And I, I just, I, I set it up with the client. I'm like, Look, you're going to be talking to the intern. You good with that? You're going to have a team. One of them, one, maybe two will lead the project. They're going to manage it through. We'll check in with you once a week for a half hour, hour, whatever you like. And behind the scenes, I'm, I'm working with them to make sure it's on track. It's the quality you want. And, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. I mean, that, that to me has dignity, not, not passing off work that's not yours. Um, and, you know, letting these guys thrive and letting them grow and do stuff they wouldn't otherwise. I mean, I, I'm blown away every, at the end of every summer, the feedback I get from, the, from these students on, uh, on how it went. It's, it's really something. Yeah, that's very very interesting and enlightening at the same time, because I have uh, talked to countless students where there was a major project on the docket. The project, you know, flows downhill, low man on the totem pulls the intern, right? So the intern does all the work, preps the whole thing. And then, you know, the, uh, the director or the VP marches in and gives the presentation on the work that someone else did rather than giving that that person the credit to do so um and thereby 
eliminating potentially that job opportunity that could come from that company or that that extended offer or that hey go back finish your senior year and you've got a place here um and i think that's a shame i think very very strong point robert i love it i think that's that's a that's a huge deal you and remind I, me one other sorry go, Joe, go ahead go ahead uh, you remind me one other point i wanted to make uh which is you gotta you gotta observe the students today they are hardwired differently than us. Mm-hmm. Explain. They are phenomenal multitaskers. Okay. They, any, any one of them has 10 apps open, five chats going, and they're talking to you at the same time. I mean, so you can't fight that. You got to roll with it. Mm. And so what I do is I give them multiple projects. If you're a multitasker, you're going to be a multi-projector because I think in a lot of ways, it's almost like a death sentence to tell a student today, you're going to work on this one thing all summer and it's all going to come down to the last day. Mm. I mean, talk about like an anxiety, stress-filled thing. And it's not even how they're naturally wired now. Mm. Instead, it's like, Hey, you're going to have four or five things to work on different clients, different projects. When you get stuck on one, switch to the other, be in communication, learn and grow and, and, you know, leverage that, that innate multitasking skill you've developed your whole life. And, and let's, let's work with you, you know? And I think that there, there's a dignity to understanding these students and, you know, working with them again, we're, we're not coddling them. We're not, we're not doing the work for them. We're, we're giving them the opportunity to thrive mm-hmm. in an environment that cares about them. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and that's, the, that's the, to me, the name of the game. So, you know, Dave, when you talk about like, you know, the, I mean, I love your story. I mean, they, they gave you a great opportunity to work on uh, many different uh, functional disciplines, sales, et cetera, and you're designing it. And I mean, I, you know, that's just great experience. And then if you can present it yourself, you're getting that experience too, of what it's like to present and be nervous ahead of time. And how do you prepare? And yep. I mean, it that, was, that's what we're talking about. It was mm-hmm. definitely a, a eye-opening internship for sure. And it was, you know, I don't think that they were prepared as well as we're talking about being prepared, but they were not, they knew they had a big job in front of them and they were going to need consistent help and they needed someone to design that help. And so it was like, you need to learn this, then 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 you need to design how we're going to continue to recruit people to help us in all these areas. So it was, it was very cool. Um, there's obviously a real requirement of the employer, or at least there should be to wind an internship down, to bring it to completion, to bring a conclusion to it. What's the, what's the key for an employer trying to do this to, um, you know, the completion of an internship, how, how should it end? Um, well, I, I love that question. Um, so at Agile Remakers, what we do is three weeks before the internship's about to end, mm-hmm. we have what we call our closeout. So one of the things, you know, rainmakers, water, surfing, what, you know, like I like that theme. And when a wave crashes suddenly on the shore, it's called a closeout. So I use that term. So we call it the summer closeout. And in that time, we meet and we say, okay, where are we on the, all the projects? Yep. Okay. And what is left to be done so that we can bring closure to it? And so we look at like, Okay, what can we get done? What's not going to get done? All right. And who's going to communicate it to a client to say, look, we've done all this, but this part here, and it just isn't going to happen. Mm-hmm. Okay. And we get alignment with the client on, you know, what will and will not happen. Okay. And what this does is it helps the students work through the last couple of weeks vigorously, intently, knowing there's a finish line. Mm-hmm. And knowing that they can plan ahead and say, okay, this is going to take about 10 hours. We're going to get it done this week, et cetera. All right. Now, what we are, what we're out to avoid here, and I think employers should really think hard about this, is we do not want that last day of drama. We don't want the last day of July, you know, to have the intern show up, having pulled an all-nighter, stressed out that the feedback they're going to get is not all positive 
And that's going to be their whole lasting impression of their summer with you. We don't want that. What we want is we want during the closeout to start to get a sense, you know, like, What's there to do? How's it going? Manage it. Manage it like you're landing a plane, right? Okay, we're going to like land it. Okay, gently. Okay, here we go, right? Like that. And we're maybe the, the term might be putting a baby down, but whatever. All right. But, you know, we're going we're gonna to ease into it methodically. We're, we're also going to like conduct surveys with them. Like, hey, what, you know, like, how was it for you? What worked for you? What didn't? Let's get all that done, right? Uh, you know, in a um, calm, cool, collected manner. Where uh, you know they're they're appreciating and they're uh, acknowledging what they did and how much they grew and all of that, and that way that last couple of days is a very nice um, you know wrap up to the summer you know and they've got a lot to look back on fondly mm-hmm. and uh, and 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 they've you know and they've done everything as well as they possibly can right because we always have an eye on quality. Um, and so, and then, so, but as also as an employer, you might want to say, you know, towards the end, it's going to end like that, but you're also going to say, Hey, um, let's, uh, let's have a, a follow-up call in a month or so yeah. just to keep that relationship going. Right. Let's, let's stay in touch, you know, and, and Hey, if you need a letter of recommendation, if, if, you know, if there's any way we can help you, if you need introduction to stuff, right. Um, you know, they, they are evolving, yeah. right. They, they are still growing. You know their their minds, their lives, everything. You know, support them uh, and, and have it end in a in a very uh, dignified manner. To, yeah. to put it bluntly, yeah. Well, and I think it's funny because in in our line of work, we talk about debriefing all the time, right? We like to do the task, get it done, make sure we do it to the best of our ability, then debrief on the right, the wrong, the good, the bad, and say, hey, next time, let's make sure we do this. Let's make sure we implement this. Let's make sure we're getting into this. And I think what you're what you're talking about, and whether it's put the baby down or land in the airplane, it's the idea that you don't come in for a crash landing. It's not a last <laughs> day. It's five. It's five oh five, and you finally hit submit, and the project is completed. And you know they go off back to their home and and their lives, and they have no feedback on what happened. They don't even know if it was good or bad. They're completely detached from the the kind of resolution of the whole thing. And so I love the idea of the the three week too, because you can really get an idea of scope completion at that point, right? If you know, you're not going to get, you know, objectives, you know, uh, X, Y, and Z done, but you got all of them from A to Z, um, you know, and, and you, you make the employer aware of it. There's no surprise at the end that it didn't get done. So they're satisfied with it and you're giving clear targets, clear expectations, right? Yeah. I mean, I think we do that. In in all things in in all areas of business, why wouldn't you create an in, or do the same thing for the internship? Because we're winding down with the last bit of time here, Robert, and and I could talk about this stuff all day because I think it's 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 fascinating. Um, to well, number one, to know what you're doing, I think it's it's incredible work. I love it, but at the same time, to know how many places are doing it wrong, and there are a lot of places doing it right too. Let's not take that away from there are companies that have an internship coordinator director that actually really manages it, manage it well. Uh, those are the kind of places you want to find. But at the end of an internship, like what, 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 where should a student be so that it was a meaningful thing? Like what's the, what's the kind of landing for them? Well, at the beginning of the internship, you want to set up some objectives mm-hmm. that you want to get out of it. And at the end, take a look. Did you achieve those, whatever they were? whether it was to learn a certain industry, make certain contacts, or prove something to yourself that you can work an eight-hour day. We take for granted that we can work an eight-hour day, but these students, they are not used to that at all. Mm. You know, they were used to a two-hour class and then an hour and a half break. We, that's not how it work, works. So whatever those personal goals were, whatever those objectives were, were they met? And so, you know, the ending is a reflection of the, you know, how the beginning went. The other thing, too, is, you know, uh, do they feel like they um, can build on it in some way? Mm-hmm. Right. That, you know, like, you know, do they build relationships that they can stay in touch with? Right. And uh, are they leaving on a, a higher note as possible? One of the things I recommend always is handwritten thank you notes. Uh, emails are a dime a dozen chat, uh, you know, chats or whatever you text Skype or, or whatever they are. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, those are informal and a handwritten thank you notes. Thank you so much. Uh, 
you know, Dave and Joe for the opportunity to intern with you this summer. I learned so much about podcasting, financial planning, whatever you threw at me, you know, if, if at any time I can come back, I, it, I would be honored, yeah. you know, something brief. It's uh, it's permanent. You put it on your desk, you know, you, you know, it's, it's physical. It's like, wow, you know, that, that intern really stands out because I didn't get any other handwritten thank you notes from anyone. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they really care and they want to stay in touch. You know, I, I love them. And um, the other thing is, you know, it's, um, there's an element of like an internship being in some ways like a transactional thing. And you really want to move away from that and have it be relationship driven. So I think the measure of a good internship for an intern is, do I have a good relationship with the people that work there, specifically the mentor or manager that I had? Mm-hmm. Keeping an, an eye on that in, during the entire internship uh, will help. And how you improve that is, you know, you ask questions, you listen, uh, you care, and and you you try to try to think about things more than just yourself. Try to think about things more than am I going to get an offer here. Think about stuff like am I making the company better? Am I making my manager look good? Am I doing things so that next year's internship class will do better? Maybe you create like a little you know two page uh, tips for next year's intern. You know things I learned that would be helpful to know day one. You know yeah. whatever it is, but like. You know, you come out of it, if you're an intern, you want to come out of it with a feeling of fulfillment. You've gotten good work done. You've got good relationships and you've got uh, something you're leaving behind that's perhaps bigger than your own personal concerns. Yeah, no. And I, I love the uh, the personal note thing. And funny because I'm a stickler for it in our company where, hey, if 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 you have an interaction with someone, you send a follow-up email. That's one thing. That's a, a non-personal business thing, right? If you have an interaction with someone and you send a follow-up, a genuine, sincere, hey, you know what? Thanks for your time. I appreciate the candid conversation. I, I really did learn a lot. Um, you know, I wish you all the best. You know, thanks. Um, those those little extra pieces absolutely make people stand out. I, I'll even give you one better. I've posted, I've hired and fired and, and been in the, as an employer, uh, 15 years. And I am shocked at how many people don't add a personal cover letter to a resume. They just submit a resume. Like it's, it's no thing. Um, and more often than not, the, the people that I end up interviewing first are the people that do take the time to write me a personal note that did some research on the company that did something like, I love what you're doing. I love your podcast. I love your, your social media content, whatever it is, but something that makes me know that they took a little extra time and effort to go in, um, will always go to the top of my pile every single time. Great. Yeah. All right, I got a couple quick takeaways before we end up. One is on bringing back memories of when I interviewed for Dave and everything that he just said. Let's say I didn't do all of it, but the genuine um, curiosity, I was, a, I was a financial advisor and then had someone ask me to help them fill out the FAFSA and realize there was a lot of things I didn't know. Um, <clears throat> I ended up getting, going down this rabbit hole of research and it was just, it piqued my interest so much that there was so much uh, that was wrong with the traditional planning world for college. And so I got my designation, was ready to start my own company and happened to see this guy's workshop. And at that point, I think it was like day after it was quick, Mm -hmm. went up and said, listen, uh, I love what you're doing. You guys are doing this right. I just got my professional designation on this. I'm studying this. Are you hiring? Cause I would love to work for you. It it took him about five minutes to hire me, but yeah, um, it was quick. (laughs) He was like, yeah, let's make this happen. Um, but the other piece of, uh, my big takeaway today is there is so much that we have talked about on previous episodes and there is a genuine recurring theme that we hear from successful people in in education when it comes to one, asking questions and two, finding mentors. And you just mentioned a few different pieces throughout today of doing just that. When you're a student, it is so valuable to ask questions, to ask other people what they do for a living. Let me, you know, what is it that you're, you do from nine to five? Does that ask yourself, you know, ask yourself questions because this be what I want. 
and doing things the right way, finding that right internship, without a doubt, as you just mentioned, could lead to right. mentors. And everyone, our first ever podcast, it was called Lift While You Climb. And it basically was that story from the Dean of University of Pittsburgh. And yep. it was as he was being lifted right by other people, it now became his goal to lift as he was climbing up the ranks. And, it, and, and what you're doing is, I think, exactly that. It's really good to hear. But that is a message that we constantly hear on through our, all of our episodes is the, the value ship of mentorship as well. Um, and, and what I think you're doing is not just doing it on your own, but you're also trying to teach other companies how to be that valuable mentor for people that will soon be in the workforce, you know, and if they learn that, then it's the same, con they're going to do the same thing. If they start their own business, they're going to look for interns because they had such a good experience. I love what you're doing. I really like the message that you brought today. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll end it there. This has been College Knowledge uh, with our guest, Robert Corey. Thank you, Robert, for your time. And it was a, it was a pleasurable interview for sure. Likewise. Thank you so much, guys. Here at Elite Collegiate Planning, we are able to send students to private schools for nearly a fraction of the cost of public schools. Visit our website, EliteCollegiatePlanning.com, to learn more. Thanks for listening to the College Knowledge Podcast with your hosts, Dave Kozak and Joe Kearns. We hope you enjoyed this week's exploration of higher education, sponsored by the College Planning Network and Paradigm Financial Group. That's all for this episode. See you next time.